So let's start with the lecture. So the purpose of this lecture is to give you an introduction as to how to convert your ideas into a business. That's the basis of the lecture. This is because many of the public universities and the private universities are encouraging students and lecturers to develop ideas and translate them into wealth or monetization, what you call monetization. But not many people are aware as to how you convert an idea in the lab into something which can be translated into a business. You need to translate it at the end of the day. So, the first component of this lecture will focus on biotechnology related businesses. So, for instance, I'll give you a simple example. In the lab, you discover some protein which has an application. You can translate it into a business model. However, there is a lag time. There's a time between the discovery to the time at which you actually monetize your idea. You'll have to go through different processes. For instance, you discover pharmaceutical compound in the lab. You have to first register that as an intellectual property. So there are different avenues for registering your intellectual property. Once you register it, you have to attract capital to convert it into a business. For instance, pharmaceutical compounds, oh, they may be in a developmental phase for 10 years. They will have to go through a process of due diligence in terms of the clinical trials. You have clinical trials, then you go in for the FDA approvals and so on and so forth. So it's a long process. So you, you need to know about intellectual property. So there are different kinds of intellectual properties which give you an avenue for basically uh, assessing the, addressing the rights to your intellectual components of your creation. For instance, you have patents, you have copyrights, you have trademarks, you have what are known as trade secrets. Okay? You can register all these in Malaysia, provided that they do not encompass, uh, they do not uh, like overarch into other domains. For instance, if you discover a compound in the a plant in Malaysia, you cannot register it as a copyright or an intellectual property based on general business models. You have to actually register it as a geographical indicator. Okay, these are from, uh, they, are they are derived from a specific geographic location and they have to be assigned intellectual property based on the location, which means that the state owns that intellectual property. However, if you took this compound and you processed it into a product, you can then obtain a copyright for that process or a patent as well. And the third thing which you should be aware of is the legal framework associated with setting up a business and the associated financial structures. Okay, so today we will be focusing on intellectual property the process of filing for intellectual property, the process of registering a business in Malaysia, and the process of, of obtaining financial support. So, we have been discussing this earlier in, about the process of registering your business just before this lecture. So, do you all know anything about filing for intellectual property? Where do you file your IP or your patent? Which office do you go to? Suppose you had a new idea, okay, you had a new and then you had a, you, need, you wanted to file for IP protection. Where will you go to? Just say. <laughs> Just say. It's okay. Which one? KPDNKK. So we actually file at MyPo. Okay, MyPo. There's a MyPo office. In KK, you can file your, yeah. So, the, when, when the MIPO receives your application, you have to go through a specific <coughs> process. They will assess your intellectual property, ensure that it is not copied or taken off from another IP, and then after a period of time, they will call you in. If it's, for instance, if they find out that it's infringing on other people's copyright, they will inform you. Then you have to modify it, and, and then you can file. Then once you file it, you'll get a, a patent number. Okay, you'll get an IP filing. Okay, 
Okay, so what we want you to do as part of your assignment, so you have one simple assignment is to identify a biotechnology related opportunity. Now, we are not going to ask you to develop a specific model, just develop an overview of the model. It can be a simple one page conceptual layout of the. So, you need to identify the biotechnology related business opportunity. It may be related, for instance, I'll give you an example. If you produce recombinant proteins in the lab, you can basically file a patent for that recombinant protein. Okay, the process of production. Then you need to look at the marketing aspect because there is a concept known as top down and bottom up in business. Are you all aware of the concept of top down, bottom up? Can you give me an example of top down business model? Top down and bottom up. The concept? Just speak it out in your own words. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, I decided to manufacture something in the lab, okay, which I assume the market will need. So I manufactured it and I put it out in the market and it never got sold because I did. I worked from a top-down model. I worked top-down. I assumed that the market needs something. So the bottom-up model is the one which is preferred. You go to the market, you assess, you survey the market. You survey what the market needs and based on the needs of the market, you develop your product. So that model is more viable as compared to the top-down model. The top-down model will work in the case of products in which you add value to market. For instance, your handphone, your Android phone is actually a model which is working from top down. They create a product and then they create a desire for the product. Okay? So a luxury watch, is a, you create a desire in the market. But for example, for a vaccine or a protein, I cannot create a desire in the market. It will be driven by the market needs. A lot of the beauty products are created by using top down. So whenever you go through a Google search, you will see, have you, are you aware of Google AdSense and AdWords? So Google actually monitors the number of keywords you use on a daily basis and they can actually determine the type of individual you are in terms of your marketing requirements. So they will do the survey without you knowing. That's how they are so powerful and ubiquitous. They know the needs of the market. Okay, so let's look at two case studies when we look at patents. So the case study number one is actually a technology transfer case study. Okay, so in this case study, you have discovered or you have through your research work, you have found out that somebody has filed a patent in one country, in a country which is not in Malaysia, it's a foreign country, and you wish to transfer this patent to Malaysia you can actually purchase the technology. So they have grants which will facilitate the transfer of technology. They are called technology transfer grants. But before you proceed on this path, right, you should understand that the cost of the involved in purchasing a patent is very high. We need to purchase a patent and bring it here. So researchers will generally resort to discovering their own product and establishing a business model as opposed to technology transfer. The advantage of technology transfer is that you get direct uh, a product which does not have to be approved through several clinical trials. Okay, You can get FDA approved product and then you can directly market in Malaysia after getting approval from the local authorities. So this is the case study one. The case study two actually pertains to something which you discover in the lab. So if you discover something in the lab and you want to establish this product in the market, you need to go through several trials, oh, you need to go through case, you need to go through, for example, a clinical drug trial. And as the it goes from strata to strata, for example, if a drug de designated for human use, the trials will be very stringent. Animal use is less stringent. If it's feed or it's fertilizer, it's even less stringent. That's why most of the entrepreneurs, they focus on the baseline, which is the agro-based business. Agro-based businesses don't require much the due diligence as compared to animal products and then as human designated products. So in the case of animal products, you may have to go for, for example, from Jakim, you'll have to get halal-based approval 
so you need to pay for that licensing as well if it's you need to if it's a product which is use it used in industry you need to get approval from sirim so you have multiple stages that's why the perception of most uh, entrance into this field right is that business is hard it's not hard if you choose the right path of model to enter into the market usually generally the product can be developed by a process known as reverse integration okay there's another concept i introduce you to top down and bottom up there is something known as reverse integration reverse integration is for instance you bring a car from abroad okay and you start marketing it in malaysia later on you decide that you need to you can actually do a ckd or ckd is a completely knock down version so you, you then import the parts and you start manufacturing it here so you do a reverse integration and later on maybe you can even manufacture components of that car in malaysia so that's a example of reverse integration you can do it for biological products as well you import a, a for example a specific drug get approval from local authorities and you market it with your brand name okay it's called biosimilar as this products and then is biosimilar so you market it in your brand name later on when you feel confident that your market has grown you can go into manufacture of the drug okay so most of the drugs which you see which you take they have for example panadol do you know what's the component yes and what's what do you, what are the different brands you get different brands right active fast and they actually different formulations so the the key principal ingredient is actually imported and then it's formulated with different components and then you brand it so that's the way you do okay so that's the way the business model works so once uh, actually it looks very simplistic but once you establish this then you can go in for the research and development part and develop your own products okay so when you speak of business which one do you choose is business the process of making money is it the process of facilitating the flow of money is it the process of capitalizing information or is that the process of leveraging which category do you all vote for among these four so, okay the, the business is actually not the process of making money although you do book building you know you build up your books meaning your your as your business grows you can take in a greater amount of credit okay so suppose you started a business and you took a loan from the bank you started off with 100000 and then you paid your loans on time your credit rating improves second time they'll give you a million and then your credit then you pay back again and then the third time will get maybe 10 million so it keeps on increasing so that's a process of book building but we are not actually making money we are actually facilitating the flow of money because when a product goes from the manufacturing stage to the time it reaches the consumer at each stage there is a monetization of the product okay there will be uh, for example a product manufactured in the factory passes through a supply chain who benefits the transporters it then goes through another chain maybe you have to package it so then you have another supply chain so everything generates income so it facilitates the flow of money so if your product is ideally placed it should benefit not only yourself it should benefit the supply chain okay so when since amazon.com and the package so fedex fedex model is they are driven by the consumer demand and then they also drive the need for the apps and everything as we sell the product so it's the whole integrated model okay the the third one is capitalizing information sometimes you may you may not be like intellectually oriented but you can see the potential of certain things so then you hire those people to manufacture the stuff okay you hire a team of scientists to manufacture for example all the software companies they'll hire very talented people to develop or monetize a idea okay the idea because every business actually starts off as a idea it's just an idea in your mind it translates into a registered business and then it becomes bigger and bigger so it goes on forever and the th third one is actually leveraging leveraging is basically placing your business or developing your business to utilize certain legal frameworks for instance in saba you may have a, a income tax a rebate for 5 years for a business set up in a special zone you set up your business you leverage that okay so you set up a business in another area which is uh, basically you have two divisions one division is in re a region which is taxable and which is generating a profit you set up another uh, subsidiary in another region in which you get a tax rebate and then you shift your accounts okay 
So that's called leveraging. You leverage the system. Okay. For instance, uh, you may get uh, Singapore. They do refining of, of fuel oils. They refine. So they receive crude oil. They refine and they export. Because the business ecosystem favors that kind of uh, infrastructure. So they'll give funds for infrastructure and so on and so forth. So it's based on business is not about having money and having big ideas. It's about leveraging and looking everything at everything from a different perspective. So that's about leveraging. So all the three lower ones, facilitating, capitalizing, and leveraging are actually the correct approach when you decide to set up business. So in business, you have the financial aspects, which we don't go into because that's handled over, handed by the, we hand it over to the chartered accountants. They do that stuff for the financial people. We have the business ecosystem, which we have to be perceptible. We have to be aware of the business ecosystem. As I told you, how to leverage and how to be up. And then you have the legal aspects. Legal aspects like, as I told you, developing end user license agreements and things like that are covered under legal aspects. So as an entrepreneur, we don't spend a lot of our energy on these things. We basically perceive and delegate. Do you know the concept of delegating? Are we aware of the concept of delegating? So a good entrepreneur always delegate authority. They will not do everything themselves. They will delegate and use their, their workspace for creative thinking. You look at perception and the market. So if you read about entrepreneurs, you'll notice that most of them delegate. They don't do things like Steve Jobs. I think he does not, he, when he was developing all the software, he designated different divisions because it's too much for one person. Okay, so when you go into the market, you have to basically follow a top-down approach. So your market research, is your market growing? How do you increase the marketability? How do you in, in do a &M, advertising and marketing? This is the key aspect which you should look when you do your top-down research. So top-down research, right, I'll give you an example. Many of, many times you see free gifts offered online. If you take the survey and get a free gift, okay, you're, good, you're actually going to get a free gift, but the information which you give to that marketeer is more valuable than the free gift because they use that to design your model. Just imagine, you want to set up a, uh, shop in a mall in KK and you don't know the market okay you set you set up a survey a very what is known as a heuristic survey it actually runs maybe through Google ads uh, Google ad AdWords or AdSense and then you know the market and then you decide to invest 1 million but if you just came here and invested 1 million without having a survey you may not have a market okay so that's how you use perception market perception or market intelligence Okay, so we come down to intellectual property or basically the protection of what you have developed using your mental resources. Okay. So you have different products in the market and they can all have an IP, intellectual property associated with them. And then there are the brands. So these are some of the brands which are basically the top brands in biotech. Have you heard of Illumina, a sequencing company? So you can see in 2002 when they set off, started up their business, their shares were about $10. In 2016, they reached, they peaked at around 250 US dollars. So you can see the return on investment for the investor. Each so, when you when your company is in operation for a certain number of years, you have to consult with a chartered accountant. You can actually go in for listing. And now, if I read correctly, last month I think the Bursa KLSE is actually going to list SMEs as well. So even your uh, shares with uh, capital of 10 cent, for instance, you start off with a face value of 10 cent, can be listed on Bursa. And that's where your capital comes in because once you list on Bursa, after a certain period of time, you can actually have warrants. You can warrant your shares, means you can generate money from the market okay, by having warrants and so on and so forth. So that's the way your business grows. Okay, so the process of uh, basically filing for IP involves money. You need to invest in the IP, so you need to have legal team. For instance, when we file an IP, the patent search is cost around 2,000 ringgit Malaysia. Okay, Then the filing process, if you have a legal team filing for you, it's going to cost you about 20,000 ringgit Malaysia. However, if you did it on your own, all you have to do is pay the fees to MIPO, which is around 200 ringgit. Okay, You can do your own patent search and you will save a lot of money. You can do your own patent filing and you will save a lot of money as well. And then you just need to pay the patent fees. 
Okay, so these are the various avenues available to you. So there's patent, copyright, trademark, industrial design, and trade secret. Okay, trade secret is the one which is usually adopted by food companies, the food processing companies. They will develop a food product, they will list everything on a paper, and they will file it as a trade secret. That doesn't have to be revealed to any other company. You can, however, if somebody wants to buy your trade secret, you can sell it to them. Okay. It can be a secret recipe. It, okay, you just file it. I think Tobasco and uh, some of the brands they actually trade secret the recipe. They trade secret. So it's it's uh, filed with the intellectual property organization of your country and say that when you want to sell it, you just transfer it. The other one is industrial design. Industrial design relates to a work which is like having a industrial significance. It can be a blueprint. However, the industrial design does not check for functionality. All they need is a blueprint. Okay, you go through them one by one. So patent. So patent is actually in Malaysia, you have the Patents Act 1983 and the amendment. So a patent is basically, I've highlighted the keywords, a new way of doing something, a new technical solution to a problem and all the information has to be disclosed in the public domain. So this is where your judgment comes into play. Do you want to file your invention as a trade secret or do you want to file it as a patent? Because when you file it as a patent, everyone can copy it. It's disclosed and it has to be in legal terms, right? It has to state what you actually did. So if you stated something and you hit something, it's, and then people can try and copy your patent and they will buy your patent and they could not replicate it, then you end up in legal problems. So you need to disclose. So many of the companies, they will not file for patent because they invested a lot of money and they are filed. The patent is visible online. So any other company, for instance, you have a patent treaty, uh, patent treaty. a company, for instance, you file in Malaysia, a, a country which does not have a patent treaty with Malaysia has, is not a signatory. They can actually copy your product manufacture it and sell it in their country as well. Okay, so this is the caveat of patent and non-patent. Patent is goes into public domain, trade secret does not. So you should be careful when you decide whether you want to file or not file. But products which have, a, for example, a global uh, reach, they can be patented. Because if you copy it and you try and market it back in Malaysia, they will be open up the door for legal action. Okay, so you get 20 years uh, protection for your patents. Okay, so you have the exclusive right over your patent. Once you file it, you can. Your patent is there, and it's sitting out. It's a patent is uh, how do you say? It's sitting out there and waiting for people to buy it. Okay, so you you broadcast your idea, people view your idea, and then they want to purchase it. Then you can sell off your patent. And you should sell it off at a higher cost than you invest it. You should get some return on investment. Okay, so there in patents, there's a subcategory known as utility innovation. For example, you took someone else's patent, you modified it slightly, and you filed it as a patent innovation. In that case, you have to cite the original patent, and usually that person who has developed the original patent will get a portion of the profit, will go back to. So that's called a utility innovation. Also permitted under MIPO. So genes, you can patent genes, provided that your gene is having a functional product. You, you associate, for instance, an enzyme, you can patent it. However, you have to synthetically alter the gene. A gene which is found in nature cannot be patented per se. You can't take a sequence. You sequence a genome, you found some gene, you can't patent it. You have to modify the gene slightly and retain its functionality. You see, it's like something like rebadging a car. You take your car, you rebadge. But if you took the same car and copied it exactly, it would be, you would probably open your, the doors for legal action, right? By the parent company, but you modify th uh, things. So you basically work outside the scope of their patent. So that's how we work with genes. So as a biotechnologist, you can patent a gene provided it's modified or altered, but not altered to the extent at which it loses its functionality. Okay, so what cannot be patented is animals. For instance, you breed new variety, you can't patent it. Okay, you cannot patent humans, even though you may genetically modify. You inject a plasmid into your system, you, and then you integrate into your genome. You actually created a GMO, but you can't patent a human. You can't patent cell lines. You have heard of HeLa cell line? 
Ila, Henrietta yes. Lacks saline. Okay, so it's you. It's basically used by all researchers, but there's no patent on it. And genes with no known function. You can't just take a fragment of DNA and patent it. It doesn't have any purpose because, in terms of the applicability, right? Your patent should be able to be industrially produced. You should be able to produce, for instance, an enzyme. You can produce it in an industrial setting. That those patents have more value as compared to some gene which has no industrial like viability. You cannot produce it in the industrial system. So you have your idea first, and you develop your patent, and you file the idea with MIPO. You have a provisional patent in which the MIPO will disclose it to you, and then you have a you have a non-provisional patent, which means you first get a registration number, and then later you get a patent number. So MIPO will issue you a patent number. Then that's your IP. Okay, so this is the process. So this is the flow chart. You can refer to it later. But basically, what happens is that you file your patent using a form, and you in every patent you have to have state what are known as claims. Okay, I claim that my gene can convert this substrate into this process in so many days. Okay, you can. You, I and then you need to support your claim with documentary evidence. For instance, if you stated my enzyme can transform x grams of substrate into y grams of compound over a period of 6 hours, you need to provide evidence for that claim. Okay, So you have to say under this condition, under these. Conditions. So if your claims are not substantiated by documentary evidence, your patent will not be rigorously, you can't basically, uh, when your patent is subject to examination, you will not be able to defend it. So you need to have proper documentary evidence. That's why we do the due diligence before we actually file. We ensure that, the, for instance, protein. The protein should be expressed. It should be functional. We need to assess all these parameters before we file for patent. Okay, that's the process. So this is one of the patent which one of the students who was working with me filed. He actually filed the patent. So it went to UMS. It took around two or three years to actually reach the stage at which it goes through the process. So now the patent is visible in the public domain and then anyone can extract it. They can produce their com the product which is a recombinant protein. However, they have to pay the university if they want to utilize this. So can you see that it's codon optimized gene which is actually, the gene actually exists in nature. It's a growth hormone gene. But when you codon optimize it, you basically change the sequence. And if you codon optimize it and it's still functional, you can then file the patent. So you can file patents for many genes. Okay, the process of codon optimization may cost you about three to four thousand ringgit based on the size of the gene. And then you can file for patent. You can do it as well. Okay, so this is the structure of a patent. So a patent basically com comprises an abstract, a description of the what is known as the invention, the claims, what you make, you state claims with the documentary evidence and then you basically need to do a prior art search. A prior art search basically looks in the market, into the patent domain with certain keywords and tries to ascertain whether you have similar patents. For instance, if you developed an RNA extraction kit, you need to modify the techniques sufficiently so as to ensure that it does not infringe on other patents. Because if you infringe, you open up the doors for legal action. Okay, a copyright is basically a literary work. For instance, you can copyright your article. You know, when you when you write an article and you submit it to a journal, who benefits? Of course, you benefit in terms of your citations and your popularity, right? In terms of your research popularity. But who benefits most is the company which transfers the copyright. You, you, when you when you uh, publish your article in a journal, you actually sign a copyright transfer agreement. So that c company gets the sole copyright over your work. So they will monetize it because some papers or some you have to pay right to download fifty dollars, hundred dollars. They monetize your. So they take your intellectual property and they generate income from them. So that's copyright. But the thing about copyright is, if you wrote a book. You will get the royalty until the day you pass away, and then your gen next generation as well. It, there is you have to go and read the copyright act. 
clearly to determine what are the terms and conditions. So that's why if you write a book, okay, your your children will also get the benefit from the book, the royalties and incomes. So it's good to write a book. Then you have trademarks. So TM. So you see the name, uh, a company name followed TM. So a trade, uh, you have trademark. So trademark you can file as well. Trademark is very simple. You just develop your trademark. You can go to a graphic artist, design your logo, and then you will have your TM trademark. Then you can file it by paying the fee. That's almost for this one. There is no. Uh, they don't do a prior art search because all the trademarks are known. They will just look through a database, and that's it. So if your trademark does not infringe on anyone else's trademark. If it does not have any offensive logos inside, you will get approved. Okay, so that's uh, about brand recognition. So when you have a trademark like this, for instance, is the biotech cup. This actually is a brand recall. There's a trademark, right? And you see, for instance, Apple. The more you know Apple, you have a recall with that. Right? You, it recalls certain characteristics of the brand. For example, reliability, then for usability or flexibility you have this or you see honda or toyota you associate this brand with certain characteristics so that's very important in branding so when you brand a product you should make sure that the brand is visible and you the public can associate that brand with certain qualities okay so that's about branding and you have trademarks Industrial design. Industrial design is also relatively easy to file because, if for instance, this structure, you can trademark or you can industrially design it. The trademark will be the name of this device. The industrial design will be a blueprint of this device. That's it. You file using the blueprint. So there is no due diligence for it besides checking that there is no other industrial design which is similar to that. If this is an example of industrial design. It specifies the parts, and if possible, you should give a three-dimensional overview of the product. Okay, so that's the five year. So industrial design have protection for five years, and you can extend every five years. You have to pay each time you extend. It's like a license. You have to pay for that, and then you get 25 years protection. Okay, so that's the end of this first module. So if you have any questions, you can ask me now. <coughs>